Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Compassion Fatigue, Education and Engagement in Animal Research and presented by Marian Esfeldt, a veterinary resident at University of Michigan. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Latte. For more information about our sponsor, visit www lawte.org. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the ask a question box located on the lower left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appear on that screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, <clears throat> please click on the help desk button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or just use that ask a question box and let us know you're having a problem. The presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the accreditation button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Marian Esfeldt. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome. Thank you, Susie, um, and thank all of you for uh, choosing to virtually attend this talk of mine today. Uh, so as Susie said, I'm a veterinary resident at the University of Michigan. And today I'm going to talk about a topic that's of really great interest to me. Um, I became aware of the concept of compassion fatigue when I was a veterinary student and taking an elective course in grief and pet loss. But it really resonated with me in how this also is regards to not just private practice veterinarians, but in our field of laboratory animal uh, science. And this has been a topic of conversation that's been um, more and more over the years getting kind of a hot topic per se in our field. There's been some webinars and articles on the subject coming out. Um, so I think this is all something that um, I'm glad everyone's starting to discuss more and more. So today I am going to be discussing what compassion fatigue is and how we can recognize it, who's at risk and why we should care about it. And then what can we do about it, including some, you know, ideas about educating people in our field about it, some strategies for combating it. So first, let's define the term. It, um, compassion fatigue is an emotional and physical burden that's created by the trauma of helping others in distress, which then leads to a reduced capacity for empathy towards suffering in the future. And a term that's also been applied to it is the cost of caring. And that was coined by Dr. Charles Figley, who's a researcher in the field of traumatology um, and psychology. And he was one of the first researchers to define this idea. And it's associated with specific professions, ones that provide care to living creatures. So that would be human and veterinary health care, mental health care workers, social workers, and of course also animal research. So the connections that we form with those that we're taking care of and repetitive empathic responses to them uh, can cause us to kind of burn out emotionally. And this makes us, uh, makes us unable or more difficult to deal with stresses in our lives, both inside and outside of work. And the most insidious aspect of compassion fatigue, I think, is that it really attacks the core of what brings people into these fields, which is their empathy and compassion towards animals and humans. So there's a couple other terms that you may find in the literature surrounding this topic, so I wanted to bring them up um, here. Secondary traumatic stress is exposure to knowledge about a traumatizing event uh, that's experienced by another. So it's a pretty apt de description of compassion fatigue. So what they found over time is that family members and counselors and people that provide care to those that um, uh, so two traumatized individuals will actually start showing similar signs to the actual traumatized individuals themselves. And then this was described as secondary traumatic stress and Dr. Charles Figley later um, described it as compassion fatigue as well. And so these terms are kind of interchangeable and you might also see vicarious trauma and secondary victimization um, in the literature as well. 
Now, some of you may have also heard the term burnout, and uh, it's sometimes used in relation to compassion fatigue, but I do want to point out that it is different. Any person in any career can experience burnout. It's really defined as what occurs um, in, uh, when a person is experiencing too much stress or pressure um, and gets too few, few sources of satisfaction in their work environment. So it's really related to kind of the external work environment. So things like your salary and how much you get paid and how far away you have to travel um, and you know vacation time. So it's especially a problem if somebody is stressed at work but they don't feel a sense of appreciation for what they're doing as well. So burnout can be treated by changing your environment. So getting a new job and a new environment can actually solve it. Um, but if someone's experiencing compassion fatigue and they get a new job, it's not going to fix the problem. Um, so compassion fatigue is associated with the specific work that we do. So, um, so as I said, leaving is not going to fix the problem. But since burnout does definitely contribute to compassion fatigue, um, and some definitions actually state that compassion fatigue is a combination of secondary traumatic stress and burnout together. Um, you can get some short-term benefits from changing jobs, but if you're staying in the same field, still working with animals, providing care to animals, um, you can continue to have the same problems in a new work environment. Now, a way that I like to think about compassion fatigue, I like this analogy that it's um, our emotional resources and compassion are like a bank. So if we keep making withdrawals, without any deposits, soon we're going to be empty. And um, it affects your job, your personal and professional relationships, and even your physical health. Um, so if compassion fatigue is the cost of caring, then what maybe is the payment? Um, there's a term that's used called compassion satisfaction. And this is when people feel really invigorated and happy by the work that they do. They feel successful. So if you're drawing out of your emotional bait constantly, but you can find ways to fill it again, um, then you can potentially improve your um, compassion fatigue uh, signs and you'll stop feeling such a harsh effects of compassion fatigue. Um, so as we continue to talk about ways to combat this, we'll be touching on basically ways that we improve our compassion satisfaction. Now, since our job in this field does usually require caring for animals, and of course the answer to this problem is to not not feel compassion at all, um, how do we overcome this? So I think the first step is really kind of what I'm doing right now is educating those in our field about it and bringing awareness to the issue. Um, in our industry, I think it's been pretty common to not discuss the emotional aspects of our jobs and not talk about the potential emotional trauma this can cause. Um, so bringing awareness to the idea that it is normal and it's okay is really important. And then, then you need to learn coping strategies, which can include self-care techniques, positive connections with our job, and also appropriate outlets for grief. And so I'll be discussing all of these throughout the presentation. So now that we all kind of know what compassion fatigue is, who's at risk of it? kind of makes sense that people whose job description directly involves working with animals would be at risk. So, you know, your veterinary staff and animal care technicians, um, and then of course your research staff, and, you know, your PIs, but also your iCook staff um, and other administrative staff, they do have a risk. So if you think about how iCook category E, you know, like protocol review, and if they're looking at a lot of category E protocols, they still are experiencing and thinking about animals experiencing these protocols. And so over time that can lead to compassion fatigue and, as well. And even our just plain, you know, administrative staff, they're ordering animals, they hear about it, they're involved in the field. So there still is a risk for everyone, um, despite if their job description requires them to actually uh, touch animals or not. Now, there, of course, are some risk factors which can predispose people to developing compassion fatigue, so I'm just going to highlight a few of them. So people who work on a daily basis with animals, especially if you're involved in a more long-term research study, that gives you more time to develop bonds with your animals, um, so that increases risk. Certain procedures or protocols people just may not feel comfortable with and may feel kind of a dilemma in performing them. Um, sometimes euthanasia would fall into this category, but also think about certain invasive procedures like surgical models of certain types, um, or perhaps the idea of using or using death as an endpoint. So I especially think of researchers themselves falling into that category for procedures. 
And support systems are really important for us to have for our mental health. Um, that means that you have people you can talk to that can kind of provide you some compassion and care to allow you to kind of refill your bank. Um, and it's more difficult, I think, just to handle emotional stress and trauma if you feel like you're alone. And now, of course, there's other risk factors very much related to an individual's personality um, and personal history. So like unresolved trauma um, previously, or really just an inability to communicate maybe their needs to others. Those can all, you know, fold into this. So it's a very, you know, individual variations in how much people are affected by this. Um, and I do want to point out that the amount of time in this industry doesn't really have any sort of um, effect on whether or not you'll develop compassion fatigue. So people can be relatively new in the field and get it quickly, or you can have been in the field for decades and not have it. So um, it's a lot of personal um, variations. So how can we try to determine if we are suffering compa from compassion fatigue? So, um, there's some different ways to categorize symptoms, um, but one way is to break them down into these categories of intrusive, arousal, and avoidance. So our intrusive symptoms are things like thoughts and images that um, kind of are intrusive into your lives they, about the traumatic experience. These can manifest as things like nightmares or just, you know, you're out of work on the weekend, but you're still remembering and thinking about something that you saw. Um, and this can lead to an obsessive desire to actually help certain animals, an unhealthy kind of obsession with things, an inability to let go of work-related matters, and um, sometimes you can just start feeling inadequate as a caregiver. For the arousal symptoms, these are things that are changes in your emotional response. So increases in anxiety and frustration and anger um, and projection of anger onto others. Sleep disturbances is really common with this, especially because these emotional responses change you physically, and you can actually get not only sleep disturbances, but what's called somatic illness, which is where you get physical effects of your stress. Um, and so you can get sick easier. You'll have worsening of chronic diseases, potentially. And then finally, the avoidance symptoms, kind of as it sounds. Um, you can get apathetic to things once felt enjoyable, both at work, but in your personal life and hobbies as well. Um, people may start to feel like they only want to put in the minimum at work when they used to feel a lot more passionate about doing more, um, maybe not feeling like they want to hang out with their friends as much, so they're starting to isolate. Um, and this can progress to even more destructive behaviors like self-medication and addiction, but you know, not just with drugs, but things like online shopping, gambling, those kind of things can worsen or develop. Um, and then there's just another way to categorize these symptoms by instead mental, physical, and behavioral changes. So they're all basically what I just mentioned, but just categorized in a different way. So just um, you can see the, uh, how they divided it up that way. So uh, Jan Spillman, she provides some retreats and workshops for people that suffer from compassion fatigue, mostly related to human um, healthcare industry. But she had this interesting trajectory of the development of compassion fatigue in five phases that I like. So I was just going to quickly go over it, where you start out in the zealot phase where you're really idealistic or like keen and committed to enthusiastic about work. As the compassion fatigue starts to set in, you get those emotional changes and irritability cutting corners, having more oversights and mistakes at work, um, and then withdrawal. So those are the avoidance symptoms where you're starting to isolate yourself from others, um, not really wanting to talk about work, and um, neglecting potentially people in their personal lives as well. And then the zombie phase is when you start putting kind of yourself on autopilot in a sense. Um, and this is where more frustration and anger sometimes can lash out. And the final result is some sort of transformation that comes from this. So you can either undergo what's called pathology and victimization, where you become overwhelmed, you kind of just continue in this state and potentially just leave the profession because you feel like this is not for me, I am obviously not doing well here. Um, but the other transformation you can have is a positive change, which is where you start to actually recognize these symptoms and start to make changes in our lives um, using self-care strategies and manages some of these underlying issues. Um, so when we find ways to manage, recognize our stressors and our satisfiers and find a balance in our chosen career, that's what I hope we can all come to. 
So now, of course, why should we care? I think hopefully most people would agree with me that caring for the mental well-being of people in our profession is important no matter what. Um, but I think that we usually draw into our profession people that do deeply care about animals. And we really want to maintain them because that promotes better animal welfare in the end. You have those caring people that want, that are committed and enthusiastic, and they're just going to help drive our profession better and better forward in advancements with animal welfare. So we want to keep them in our field. Um, but if you want buy-in from leadership for supporting mental health initiatives, then maybe you need a little bit more than that. So I also think we should start framing this as a occupational health issue, actually. Um, and other people agree with me. Um, so in the current edition of the Lab Animal Medicine Blue Book, actually, you'll see that in the occupational health chapter, they talk about psychosocial hazards of what we do. And these pretty much line up with compassion fatigue. So it talks about how the human-animal relationship and research is complex, and there can be some kind of um, psychological dissonance with the idea of we have animals as pets, maybe in our home, versus animals at obje as objects at our work for use. I mean, that can be difficult. And it mentions specific hazards like desensitization to euthanasia or certain procedures, and how all of this leads to anxiety and depression. And of course, all of these psychosocial hazards are related to compassion fatigue. So I think it's really important that we start getting our occupational health programs to be on board. Um, and our institutional leadership to kind of recognize it as a work hazard in our specific profession and actively work to strategize on an institutional level ways to combat it. Um, now, of course, that's a very slow change that can happen over time. And I know, you know, some occupational health programs don't, in my personal experience, uh, don't feel like they're equipped to deal with this, which I understand um, if you don't have mental health professionals in your occupational health program. Um, but I think it's something that we need to start talking about and thinking about it maybe this way so that over time we can start utilizing occupational health programs as a way to bring in compassion fatigue strategies. Um, and also an institution should care because if employees are experiencing compassion fatigue, there is an overall noticeable increase uh, or um, noticeable effect on the workforce. So if you have a lot of effective workers in your company, you're going to see decline in morale and productivity. Um, so staff may not, you know, complete assignments and tasks or meet deadlines on time as much. There'll be trends like higher absenteeism because people are out sick more. Um, and there'll be higher turnover rates. I think that's a pretty clear one that people see in our field sometimes. And actually, there can potentially be higher worker compensation claims because with decreased concentration and commitment, you can get higher levels of injury. Uh, and then decreased morale is a huge one. Um, interdepartmental dysfunction goes along with that. Your teams may not start working together as well because people are more irritated and frustrated and quick to anger. So, um, and then the other problem is if somebody new enters this environment that's already having people experience a lot of it, even with a lot of self-care, it can be really difficult to maintain a healthy mental state just because of that kind of cycle that's already happening in the place that they enter. So this isn't just a topic for individuals to think about, how we can help ourselves, but also a company to think about how we can help our workforce to increase you know, productivity. Okay, so what can we do about it? Um, so of course, um, there's many ways to approach this, and I hope that I, and I'm sure some of you have had some great ideas I haven't even thought of, um, but this is kind of based on what I've done and talked to other people about. So um, I think one step you can start to do is send out a survey to your employees at your institution and determine where they think the biggest issues are and their ideas for changes that can be made. Um, to improve their work environment. Now, we did not do this in Michigan when we started kind of our compassion fatigue stuff, but I've talked to um, a couple other places that did this, and um, I think that it's really amazing because you may be passionate about it, but you don't realize some things that somebody else in a different department had ideas about how to improve stuff. So you can get a lot of, generate a lot of really ideas and interests this way. Um, so I think that was a really good idea. Um, but increasing awareness and education of the topic is really important, and that's kind of how we started at Michigan. Um, 
when you start talking about it and employees start hearing about it, it does create over time a, um, an environment that normalizes people's emotional responses to working with animals and encourages them to express feelings free from shame and embarrassment if they realize, oh, it's okay that you can grieve over animals in our work. Um, so the more time, more people talk about it, um, I think people realize it's okay to feel connected to animals, feel compassion, and also then it gives people a better chance of recognizing these signs in themselves, um, and if necessary, then start determining strategies for coping on a personal level. So how you can start increasing awareness can vary. We started by offering just a couple educational lectures for our staff. So we made a general announcement at our all staff meeting about it, and then had some um, more in-depth lectures then to attend, and they were similar to kind of the beginning of this presentation um, in terms of talking, uh, did a little bit more in-depth about um, uh, some signs and things like that. Um, and that, these were put together by me and another technician, so we're not experts by any means, but we became potentially experts, so I think anyone, even if they don't think that they can do it, if you have an interest and passion, um, you can become the expert at your institution and give a talk on this. Um, and we also did have a counselor we, who came in during this time to talk about personal coping mechanisms. And I'm gonna definitely circle back to counselors later, um, but we did include her during the educational talk. Uh, now, another way we implemented uh, awareness is with just like this poster. Uh, I worked with our Office of Research Communications to create and distribute them into our animal facilities. And the goal was to disseminate information not only to our internal kind of animal care staff, but also to the wider research community because all of them could be affected. So we wanted to be able to reach uh, everybody as much as possible. So I'm just gonna look closer at the contents. It's a pretty simple poster. Um, we just wanted to have a statement that emotional distress can occur in this job and basically showing that the university recognizes this can happen. And then we put a link to the cost of caring brochure that's been put out by ALAS. Uh, which is a really great resource uh, about um, human-animal bond and grief in our field. And then finally, we put our information for universally providing counseling services, which I'll also circle back to when I talk more about counselors in the future, but it's information um, so that it's easily accessible for everybody. I mentioned the cost of caring brochure. I just wanted to show it here if you guys haven't heard about it. Um, I recommend you just look it up on the website and download a copy of it. It's really great, like very simple, addresses uh, the human-animal bond in the field and states that acknowledging feel, or feelings of animal care workers and providing support in the workplace is really important. And I like the statement that they have in there that says, if bereavement is addressed appropriately, individuals will feel validated, their coping mechanisms will be strengthened, and their ability to sustain new bonds and form new bonds will be reinforced. So um, this is a great uh, resource. This is why I included it on the poster because it kind of is a nice summary. It's easy, you don't have to put it together yourself. Um, so I encourage you all to look that up. Um, now, since all animal users are at risk, I think that putting it in some, in some information about this in a required training of some sort is a really good step that everybody should go towards. Um, have it either in an online training or in-person training, however your institution does it. Um, I worked with our training core that we have at Michigan um, and put some language in our required animal training for new users. And I just put a little snippet of it up there. You don't have to read that. Um, but we already had a section in our new user training called the dilemma, which really talked about the ethical cost of using animals in research in general. So it was a perfect spot to actually put in some information about the emotional effect on humans as well for, um, and then also include the links to the counseling services that are available at the university. Um, and we do have a required hands-on training for our new rodent users, which um, our trainers started to just mention this as well during the, um, the in-person classes and just uh, bring it up. So again, more we talk about it, more people start recognizing that it's a thing, um, especially researchers, you know, graduate students, PhD students aren't the ones who usually come to ALAF and those kind of meetings where this is being talked about more and more. So I think it's really important to try to reach that population of animal users. Um, and another option, if you don't wanna come up with something yourself, uh, the ALS Learning Library recently published this module and um, I think it's great that the team that put it together um, agreed that 
it should go into the occupational health section of the training. So that's where you would find it. Um, and it's a really pretty short one, and it's a great uh, set, uh, resource to start with, even just for yourself if you're interested in learning more, but also especially if you're using the ALS Learning Library for your required uh, training for your users already, it's really easy to just add that in as a module um, that they should go through. Um, so I would really encourage everybody to put something in required user training either related to compassion fatigue, but even if you don't want to use that terminology, things like using words like psychosocial hazards or talking just about emotional costs of working with research animals, I think it's really an easy way to bring awareness is put it in some sort of required training. And there's another uh, way that you can kind of evaluate compassion fatigue uh, individually and in your program is this online tool that's out there, and it's called the Professional Quality of Life Scale and it's available for free online. It was developed by Dr. Figley and another researcher that I can't remember her name of at the moment. Uh, the language in there is geared more towards social worker type professions, but uh, Catherine Dobbs, if anyone saw, I think in 2014, she gave a talk at ALAS about compassion fatigue, and she used this test and with the author's permission, changed the verbiage in the questions more to gear towards animals. And she provided that to me for free. And um, so you could contact her or you could contact me. Um, I could get you that version of the test. Um, her name is Catherine Dobbs. Um, and it's a pretty short test. You can hand it out to employees to do on their own time to gauge their own qual you know, their own level of compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction. It kind of tests for both. Um, the way I used it was at Michigan, we just handed it out at our educational lectures for people to take home you know, and do on their own time. But if you wanted to use it as an anonymous survey, you could ask people to fill it out and then, you know, not, no names, so there's no association with anybody particularly. And then you can kind of have a sense of how it is at your university, what the percent of affected people are. Or institution, I said university, but obviously not everyone's at a university, sorry. Um, so once you've started to bring awareness to what compassion fatigue is, what are the next steps that an institution can take to prevent and combat it? Um, so personal coping mechanisms are an essential part of managing work stress, uh, burnout, and compassion fatigue, which includes things like self-care and mindfulness. And depending on where you work, you actually may already have a bunch of resources available to you for this. Um, if you're at a medical school, there actually can be resources for hospital staff um, regarding compassion fatigue that are already there and available for you. Um, our institution has um, a really great HR program that provides individual and um, department kind of style workshops and lectures on things like reducing stress, and mindfulness, stuff like that. So those are great that you can utilize the trained counselors already for. Um, and so I talked about how we had a counselor come in and speak uh, during our kind of initial education lectures on self-care topics. And we reached out to our counseling program, and this is something really important that I think I, I want to stress is whenever you're going to utilize a counselor, it's important to reach out to them first and talk to them about animal research, the realities of what we do, you know, and make sure that they're comfortable with it because the worst thing you can do is bring someone in who has a negative opinion, and you can risk traumatizing people worse depending on the reaction you know the counselor so make sure that they're you know they have accurate information about what your department does I um, mean it's okay to you know and our, our counselor said like ethically a counselor has to declare you know if you say hey what's your feelings on animal research because this is what we want you to talk about they have to tell you if they you know are vehemently against it because that would be a com ethically conflict for them to be involved with that so I think that's really important to uh, remember um, and just look into resources. This is what I want to stress. Look into resources you might already have, especially like luckily at Michigan, we're a big university. So we have these resources available already for us to start, you know, actually tapping. Um, however, you, I, mean, I don't think there's any reason you couldn't reach out to an external counseling service. And as long as you find someone who's comfortable with animal research, is willing to come in, you can utilize the expert that way. Um, but also there are, uh, I found two research um, Specific, animal research specific consulting services that will travel to your university and do compassion fatigue seminars and workshops as well. So these are people that are, you know, obviously um, know about our field and are involved in it. 
Okay, so mental health professionals say that the cornerstone of the prevention of compassion fatigue is actually good self-care. And so these are some of the kind of stuff we talked about with our counselor um, when she talked with us. I'm obviously, you could go into huge depth into this topic and I'm not going to, um, but I just want to show that I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on this matter, but you can find information out there and give it to your employees, you know, and talk about it if you're willing, even if you're not an expert, you know, self-care techniques um, are the, important to just bring up and mention. So I was just going to go over some of these really important ones, like, um, ge very generally. Um, so I think everybody knows that getting enough sleep is really important. Um, not getting enough sleep makes you vulnerable to stress and compounds physical ailments. So this is all going to affect our compassion fatigue uh, levels. Um, exercise may be one of the more overlooked uh, types of self-care because it's actually been shown that exercise, just mild, you know, exercise can help combat feelings of depression and chronic health problems. Um, so thinking about maybe doing something with a group, like with a, making a walking group for lunch at your institution or something like that, you can even make it more, you know, instead of just by yourself, you can involve a group of employees in things like that. Um, proper eating and drinking, so you have more energy to deal with stress. Um, so finding your time, finding time for yourself every day is really essential for your mental well-being. Um, and going along with this is finding ways to recharge your energy, which may be things I mentioned like exercise or meditation or yoga. Um, but really just the most important thing I just want you all to be aware of is that making yourself a priority and setting some self-care goals uh, that will work for you is really important. And I really like that analogy, so I put it in here, because the way that our counselor described why self-care is important in relation to compassion fatigue and stress is that everyone's, it's the water bottle metaphor. So uh, imagine your stress and trauma kind of levels like a water bottle. And everyone's ability to manage it in our lives is different. So everyone has a different size water bottle just naturally. Um, and we'll fill it up and we can handle our stress levels until at some point it's gonna overflow. You're gonna hit your tipping point. And this leads to those manifestations of all the signs of compassion fatigue that we've talked about, you know, like changes in emotional responses, those outbursts, trouble sleeping. But if we can decrease the flow of water, that's great, but that's not always possible, right? You can't always prevent the stresses and things in your job. You can't change things. So in order to continue handling the flow coming at you, you have to find ways to poke holes in the water bottle, kind of, to allow you to handle that amount that's coming in. And these holes are basically those little self-care things that you provide and you do. And so I just think that's a really nice analogy, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, and something that is also a really good idea is to have some sort of transition from your work to your home. Um, I flipped this picture because I think the analogy is more turning from Superman at work back into Clark Kent at home instead of the other way around. Um, so for those of us who have people at home like family or pets or just roommates, sometimes as soon as you walk in the door from work, you have to start caring for a whole new set of people or animals. So since our jobs a lot of times require actively caring for other people during the day or thinking about living creatures during the day, it can be really draining to go directly from one to the next without stopping to give yourself some time. So this is talking about that me time, that recharge and renewal. Um, so I think it's important to have a transition period between the two um, and carve that out for yourself. Um, you could, you know, just stay in the car when you get home for 10 minutes and listen to an audiobook that you wanted to listen to or whatever. Um, and then another thing you could do is more um, kind of a symbolic way to put away the day is transition out of your work clothes into your a different set of clothes as soon as you get home and you're in your me space now and try to just divide yourself from your work more actively. And also, if you have to do work at home, try to set a specific area for your professional work separated from the rest of the areas of the home to kind of continue making those symbolic separations, which can help your mind separate them as well. And as the nature of our work can cause us to sometimes do things that we consider unpleasant, it's essential that you determine if there's any things that you find especially distressing and you would consider off limits and draw the line for yourself. And that could mean certain species that you can't work with, certain types of procedures or protocols you don't wanna work with. And obviously, when you're applying for a job, you could look for a position that meets those requirements. 
so you can continue work in the field that you want to work in while minimizing what's traumatic specifically to you. Um, now, in a current job that you're in, you may have some flexibility to allow you to decide that line, but not always. You know, obviously understand this is something you would hopefully do, but it's not always possible. Um, and I just, I want to bring that up for people that are supervisors or managers. Um, think about that with your employees. If you have the ability to help them be flexible, if they come to you and kind of be open to listening to them or recognizing when there's something maybe stressful and there's a way that you can do things like work sharing or, you know, at least especially just communicating with them. So I think something really important is communicating about animal endpoints and giving people the the opportunity to be present or not present for maybe an endpoint for an animal, especially a one that they've formed a bond with. Don't just assume for them that they may not want to be there because it's just stressful. Maybe they need that to stay closure or they want to be the person that's there because um, that allows people to help form their own coping mechanisms for things that we do that can be traumatic. So I think it's important, especially for supervisors and managers to consider um, how much you communicate with your employees about things like that and just being flexible as you can, obviously it's not always possible. Now, I mentioned before about support systems, and this is really important as a coping mechanism and something that we can actively try to do in our jobs. So something that's really unique in our field, I would say, is a lack of social support we get for what we do. So I think everybody's pretty aware animal research can be a controversial topic. And I'm sure many of you have actually experienced negative reactions when you tell people what you do. And sometimes that means you don't tell people what you do. <laughs> I've had that exact experience myself. Um, so, and because of that, then you're less likely to share with others maybe something that is traumatic to you. And so we don't talk about it. And, um, you know, I, so I like to think about it like this. If a firefighter has experienced something really traumatic, you know, helping somebody, you know, and they had a traumatic experience, they can talk about it with somebody in the community and they are feeling like a hero because that's how they're viewed. And so they get that support from the society saying, you know, you're a hero, your job is amazing, you know, what you've done. And so it helps them re-energize. It does help to have that external support, but we as an industry potentially don't have that. Um, now this leads into a whole topic about transparency in our industry and how we can work to actually grow, I think, a better social support system um, with, through openness and transparency. And there's definitely some talks just coming up recently about this topic exactly. Um, if you're interested in that, the Americans for Medical Progress organization is something really great to look into. Obviously that's not what this topic, topic is about or this talk, but um, I think that uh, it is something that we can actually work as a, um, as a field to actually kind of grow a better social support network by being open about what we do and sharing the amazingness of biomedical research so everybody understands. Um, so friends and family, I, I didn't actually, um, haven't talked about friends and family yet. So in that same vein, because they, um, friends and family may not understand what we do or you know, you don't want to share with them what you do. You, they may not be the best support system for specifically for compassion fatigue in our field. They may be, you know, but if you don't have friends and family, um, you may need a different kind of support group available for you. Um, so I discussed counselors and I want to talk about how useful I think counselors are. So if your institution has internal counseling support available, I think number one, it's essential to make sure your employees know about it because I found that a lot of people, myself included, didn't really realize that we have a support system with free counseling available for people that work at our university. And so and our, a lot of our animal technicians didn't know about that either. So we worked with our counselor at the service to make some informational cards to put into our staff break room. And this is the front of the card that she put together with a little quote from a Merck uh, Research Laboratory Memorial Service that they had, um, which is really nice. And then on the back, information on the employee assistance program. So making sure people are aware of the resources that are already there is really important. Um, and then something I am also especially fond of that we can do in our industry is a peer support group. So we started one of these at our at Michigan uh, that occurs once a month and the meetings are a time for people to come in and discuss specific issues, you know, for others to offer support, suggestions to each other. Um, 
really, you can structure these kind of support groups however works best for your place of work. Um, and me and another technician, Kaylee Bennett, she and I, you know, became the facilitators of the group. We didn't, you know, lead it per se, but we found that the biggest thing that we had to do as facilitators was to try to keep people on topic and prevent it from becoming just an unhealthy rant session. Because there is that tipping point between trying to be helpful when people are sharing about problems versus just, you know, venting about the job until it becomes a circle of everybody's venting and then now you've made a negative emotional experience. And so you kind of have to try to hold that balance of, okay, well, let's try to give some positive feedback or, you know, um, support. Um, and then we, something that I really liked that we did was people that came, we would ask them to come up with a self-care goal for themselves and then check in uh, uh, throughout the meetings and give each other, each other accountability so that you can't just say, oh, I should do that. And then you never make any changes because everybody does that. So it's kind of nice to say, okay, this is what I want to do. And then next time, maybe you didn't do any of it. And so we can ask you, what can, is there a way we can help you? motivate you. So I think that that was really important. So I think this next topic here, employee engagement, is one of the most important for preventing compassion fatigue, which is really connecting with the purpose of why we do what we do. So when someone can connect with the difference that they're making in the world because of their job, it can help them understand how important they are, which really helps with employee engagement and job satisfaction. Um, so people really need sometimes help remembering what drove them to enter this field in the first place. Um, now, although many on the animal care side are not directly involved in the research, uh, they're obviously, we know, an essential part of the process. And sometimes people need to be reminded of that, especially by connecting them with the research outcomes of the research that, you know, they did help at ground zero basically help happen. Um, and this sense of purpose increases morale and retention of workers. And we know, of course, animals are greatly benefited by having a caring and compassionate worker force. So we need to keep these people in our field engaged in our field. Um, now, the human animal bond is what connects us to the animals we work with. And I, I want to make sure it's clear that like, some people would say that if somebody's experiencing compassion fatigue, then maybe they just, you know, shouldn't like work with animals. But I think that we need to encourage the human animal bond because it's important to form bonds with the animals we work with because that's why they have such good care. Um, it's our emotional investment in the animals that we care for that propels us to advocate and work for their well-being. Um, so you have to find a way to strike the balance between being emotionally invested, but not so emotionally attached. And that's a very hard balance to strike, but I think, um, and obviously that's, you know, something that talking to a counselor might help in an individual way. Um, but I think self-care techniques as and, and connecting with your purpose of doing why we, what we do allows people to kind of continue to renew those emotional resources and allow them to form bonds over and over and continue having that caring, passionate compassion for animals um, over decades of time. So talking about connecting employees with the research side of things, um, there's ways that you can do this. For instance, we have a program where we have research seminars with investigators coming in to talk to our husbandry staff um, and share their work. So that way we can bridge that divide that sometimes happens, especially in a huge institution like Michigan, between researchers and husbandry staff. Um, and this way, employees can hear those specifics about amazing outcomes of research that's happened directly with the animals they may have been changing cages for. Um, and I think that that really helps um, bridge that divide. And another more passive way you can do it instead of an active seminar is through newsletters. So we have a monthly animal care and use program newsletter, which has research spotlights every time with amazing research that's come out of Michigan. So you can read about, for instance, here, why, especially bred rats that, you know, maybe somebody was like, oh, I changed cages for this lab. You know, these, you know, these animals led to increased knowledge about the connection between ex exercise and um, endurance capacity and heart attacks. Um, so I think newsletters are really great. So how else can we keep employees engaged in our field? Something 
that I think maybe sometimes is overlooked is actually empowering employees to be involved in decision making, especially those that may feel on the animal husbandry side when they're, you know, lower down the authoritative totem pole, they feel like they don't have any input into decisions being made about animals at work. Um, so we have an, an animal enrichment committee at Michigan that I think is a great way that we empower our employees. Um, we invite everyone from all over the department to participate. So it doesn't matter if you are an administrative staff or a husbandry worker, anybody can come. And this committee was started very small, you know, not less than a decade ago, and it has grown to be basically a very essential part of our animal care program. Um, it generates ideas that we can investigate and, you know, validate and test and implement. And there will be a talk I don't actually know if it's already happened, I hope not, but uh, Jenny Jones, our animal enrichment coordinator, is going to speak about this um, in depth today. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. I just want to bring up as a possibility of, I think it's really good to actually combat compassion fatigue to think about these kind of engagement. Um, and just a few things that the enrichment committee has actually done in terms of not only the people that are on the committee themselves, but even the wider community, they engage employees and researchers to do stuff like recycling glove boxes for our rabbits and rodents and jug, milk jugs for our pigs so that people can feel like they're actually directly contributing to the enrichment program, even if they, even if they don't come sit on the committee. Um, and then they've also done really amazing things like fundraising um, in order to have money targeted specifically for the enrichment committee um, for um, the enrichment program. And then you know, I've talked about administrative staff. Something that was a pretty amazing idea, I thought, was this farm-to-table herb garden program where admin staff could grow herbs on their desks that then we would harvest and actually feed as enrichment to some of our animals. And so that was a way to have people feel like a positive connection to the animals that they're working around and for but never even see, which I think um, was really nice program. And then something really important is our um, subcommittees on certain special topics that have formed to take on more complicated issue, which gives um, some technicians opportunities to take lead on various issues. So talking about that empowerment, it allows people to grow and, um, you know, because of one of our technicians, uh, Sarah Thurston, who's also talking, she's super passionate about our, about pair housing rabbits. Now she is pretty much an expert and the lead on our and created a actual um, position for her for rabbit social housing here. So, you know, it is a great way to empower employees to even grow in their own careers as well. Um, and allows our technicians to feel kind of that renewed sense of purpose um, and also better our field. And then the last topic I'm going to discuss today is the use of animal tributes or memorial events to help us remember animals that we've used in research and thank them for their contribution. And this is kind of where I talk about like those outlets for appropriate outlets for grief. Um, so it gives people um, a way, you know, a safe space to share stories and, you know, actually grieve and talk about their emotions. And this is a great way to validate, normalize feelings um, for those that do experience it um, and can then therefore combat compassion fatigue. And the tributes, excuse me, can be actual services or you can dedicate maybe like a statue or a plaque or a garden space or whatever you choose to do. And actually there's been quite a few places that have been doing memorial events for decades successfully. And I encourage you to look up this 2002 Eiler article by Susan Illiff um, about the subject called the fourth or additional R, remembering uh, the animals. Um, and so you can see here, this is a list that comes from this article that just talks about some of the places that have been doing these events already. Um, and I know um, other institutions have recently implemented some of these kind of uh, events. Um, and I know one, for instance, was able to get a patient to come speak at their event to talk about um, how their life was saved due to medical advancements because of animal research. So that direct, you know, from bench to bedside kind of connection um, so I think that was a great way to connect everyone who attended with the purpose of what we're doing. And so if you can have some kind of connection like that, that would be really great. Um, this is an example that Susan had in her article, which was about um, this Korean Food and Drug Administration actually has a pagoda outside of it 
on the grounds of their main facility in Seoul, and every year they have an animal ceremony to honor the lives of the animals. I think they started in 1983 doing that. So this is just a nice little plaque that's basically a pagoda, but or you could do like a plaque like that. And actually the first known commemorative activity in North America that focused on animals um, was held in Guelph, University of Guelph in 1993. And I just wanted to read a little quote from the text that they said at that event because I really, I really liked it. I love the, I like the sentiment that it has. And it says, we are causing animals to be born, causing them to live through a variety of unusual experiences and causing them to die. This is a form of power that cannot be taken lightly. Today is an opportunity to acknowledge the animal's role in what we do, to acknowledge that without them, our research and teaching would be fundamentally altered. To thank the animals seems logically inappropriate because their contribution was taken, not given, yet we are grateful for and even dependent upon their role. And I just think that that is a really interesting way to frame my own feelings on uh, the use of animals in research. And I think it's really important to acknowledge um, and thank them for their role in what we do. At Michigan, something that we've been doing in kind of a memorial sense is using these memory boards. Uh, so for the past two years, we've been doing a science of enrichment symposium, and we've provided cards for people to share stories, just names or a picture of an animal uh, that they would like to honor, and then we display them, uh, which has really uh, been very well received. Uh, we've also given out paper seed hearts for people to write a name on and take home and plant in their own garden um, for to create maybe a memorial garden. And this year's enrichment symposium were I'm hoping to actually provide some flower bulbs for people to take home um, and plant. We also uh, use these memory cards. We have a different version of them um, that we put at our department booth for our annual, annual university-wide research fair. So this was allowing anyone who came by the booth, so you know people that actually worked with our department, but also researchers from all over campus could come by um, and contribute a card, and then we would display those throughout the day. So that was a great way to also try to involve our research staff in this. Now, our, we have a compassion fatigue committee um, at U Michigan, and we've started to work to develop our own official memorial event, um, which we would like to frame as a celebration more than a memorial. I like that idea that um, we would use it to highlight research accomplishments that have come out of the University of Michigan over the last year, and then also talk about advancements for our animals themselves, so things that about our like rabbit social housing and dog social housing programs. Um, now, funding such an event can be difficult. We are hoping to partner with our larger, larger office of research to utilize funds and therefore make it not just an internal departmental style event, but actually an event open to the entire research community. Um, as, again, trying to reach not just our own, our own field, but um, researchers outside as well. And some other ideas that have come up that, you know, we may or may not be able to do, but I think it's good to talk to other people about these ideas is, you know, having some sort of art dedicated that um, is either made, we even talked about having animals make the art, like if we could get um, non-toxic paint and have the animals walk across paper and then make that kind of art that you could display. Um, and dedicate, or if you have outside space potential, you could secure a little spot of it. You could plant a tree or put a plaque there, um, have a place for maybe specifically for quiet reflection time. So overall, I think that animal memorial ceremonies are a really wonderful way to keep employees engaged in their job and create this culture of openness and discuss the idea of compassion fatigue and the human animal bond and function as a coping strategy. So to conclude today, um, I have shared ideas to try to combat compassion fatigue in our industry. I believe we must first make sure that there's an awareness of the topic and then provide resources regarding individual coping mechanisms and consider how we can provide support systems to others, especially if people don't have external support systems as well. We really need to work on engaging employees to promote increased job satisfaction helping them remember the importance of why we do what we do, um, and then provide some sort of memorial activity or tribute um, or celebration, um, even as an opportunity to express grief. And I hope some of you may be inspired today to implement some changes at your own institution and be the change that I believe our profession needs. 
Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for their time and attention today, and you are free to contact me. Uh, we'll do some a couple questions right now, and you can contact me with any other questions uh, if I can't get to them. I wanted to put some acknowledgments up here. Um, people at the University of Michigan that I've worked with, Kaylee Bennett, Jennifer Jones, um, Jenny Lofgren, and Sarah Thurston have all been involved with the Compassion Fatigue stuff there. And Sarah Thurston's taking over as our Compassion Fatigue Committee uh, chairman as I'll be leaving my residency uh, in the next six months. And then I also wanted to put up uh, two people that I met at the University, or at ALAS just last year, uh, Preston, uh, who is going to be doing an ALAS webinar on Compassion Fatigue, um, and, and Andriana Pavin from Ohio. So they've been implementing some things and they have, they're great resources as well um, for doing compassion fatigue stuff. So I would encourage you to, if you know them, to talk to them or reach out to them. Um, so yes, thank you very much. And we'll do questions thank now, you. I believe. Yes. And thank you, Marianne, for the informative presentation and inspiring work and culture you've created in your lab. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look at the questions already coming in from our audience members. Our first question, Graham, is, what was the biggest hurdle you encountered getting started? Uh, great question. So um, I think the biggest thing uh, specifically at Michigan was we're a huge institution and you know with a lot of employees and we were going through a lot of change when I was trying to start up something. And a lot of people were experiencing work burnout, just overworked. And um, so that was difficult to get people to actually even care because there was like, I'm overworked. I don't have time to try to come to some lecture or do a peer support group because they don't have time in their day. So that was, that was definitely difficult. Um, and I think it was just a lot of persistence on the part of me and Kaylee to say, we really want to, um, change the culture here. And so it may be a kind of slow going, but um, just kind of slowly being like, okay, we'll just keep offering the peer support groups and keep, you know, bringing it, putting it on our, um, you know, employee newsletter so that everybody knows it still happens. And we started to get more people interested in attending. Um, so that definitely was a big hurdle is getting people to realize that they should care about it as well. <laughs> and I want to um, also thank our audience members for their questions today. We're, we have a few more here and any questions that aren't answered today will be emailed to you um, in the future. Our next question, what are some resources that you recommend to learn more about compassion fatigue? Great question. So um, I actually do have here a couple more slides that I didn't show you right here at the end um, with some resources. So. I think that the, I did mention, of course, the ALAS Learning Library, so I'd recommend for sure looking at the Compassion Fatigue module. Um, also, the American Veterinary Medical Association as, uh, you know, recognizing, of course, in our kind of general um, practitioner veterinary side that this is a big problem. So they have a whole web page. Um, so if you Google and look for the Work and Compassion Fatigue page on ABMA, uh, they have a lot of great resources about it. Um, so I'd mentioned Catherine Dobbs. She's the one who had changed the um, professional quality of life scale wording. So she has a website as well at catherinedobbs.com. So that's, uh, she has some great resources on compassion fatigue. And, you know, she came and spoke at ALAS. So even though some of them are more geared towards um, general veterinary medicine, you know, she obviously understands our field. And then there's the Compassion Fatigue Awareness Project. Um, which also has some great resources um, that kind of compiles it all on the website there if you're interested. And then I did mention the consulting services before, and I did put up their information here. Um, so I met uh, the lady, uh, Anek, Anike Kaiser from Cope Plus at ALAS. She was there, and she has created this um, counseling kind of um, uh, consulting service 
specifically for people in the animal research field. And so she, I know, worked with Preston at the University of Washington doing a kind of a needs assessment with them. So they're great. She's a great resource to reach out. I know Preston really liked working with her. And then the animal research consulting company at animalresearchconsulting.com, I just found online that they offer uh, workshops and like uh, seminars. To, they'll come in and talk about compassion fatigue specifically. Uh, so that, those were the two kind of consulting services that if you uh, want to reach out to an outside expert, they're really great uh, to, to go to. Thank you. <clears throat> we have time for one more question. What's one piece of advice for someone who wants to start compassion fatigue initiatives at their own institution? All right, great, uh, great question. I would say the biggest thing is trying to get, you know, more than just yourself <laughs> because you want to have a sustainable program. So you don't want it to rest on just the shoulders of one person who may be leaving for three years from the, you know, after the residency is done. You want to make sure that there's a group of people that can, you know, be interested in this. So finding some interested people and forming a committee so that you can, you know, help each other and make sure that that, I think it's really important, it's to try to make sure that there's people from a lot of different places within the institution. So, you know, having from the veterinary side, the business office side, you know, your husbandry technicians or your trainers, and that will give you a lot of different perspectives that I think are really important to kind of craft a program that will meet a lot of different needs, is that getting a lot of those perspectives of how is this, you know, what kind of things would be the most beneficial for husbandry obviously may not be the same for veterinary staff. So I think that that's a really good thing, you know, to do is reach out and find people that you can kind of coerce into saying, hey, this is really important. Let's, let's meet about this so that you also have that accountability to and, you know, drive to go together if everybody's like interested. Because if it's just one person, it can get overwhelming and hard to start things and you may feel like, oh, I can't do this. But um, and then obviously, I mean, this, you only asked for one piece of advice, but I would say, you know, reach out to people at other institutions too. You're not alone if you want to start this. Obviously, you can ask me, you can ask Preston. Um, there's so many people out there that have started these compassionate initiatives from nothing to making it something. So you can do it, but you can always reach out to other people that have done it before um, for advice and just support to feel like it's, you know, it's, it can be slow going and it, you can feel um, you know, you can feel discouraged at times sometimes, uh, but I think it's so important that we need to keep talking about this in our field. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And I want to thank you um, again for this presentation. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our attendees today before we close down? Um, I guess I'd just like to say, well, thank you all for, you know, sitting here and listening to this, and I hope that you learned something, and I really hope that it did inspire you that, you know, this is something that um, we need to start considering more and more that, you know, we need to care about the mental well-being of, you know, ourselves in this profession, because as I've said, obviously, throughout this, that having people that remain positively engaged and can continue forming bonds and feel compassion that obviously is only going to help increase the animal welfare because you're having more people that are you know wanting to promote animal welfare um, and keep those people in our field i think it's really important that we don't lose those people that are so passionate about it because they get overwhelmed with the emotions that maybe they didn't expect to experience because nobody told them and then they felt like they're they're wrong or it's abnormal like no well, nobody else is feeling this maybe this is weird and maybe i shouldn't be in this field because you know nobody talks about it but you know and i personally have experienced that in the beginning of this field that people didn't talk about it so i think that's important just to say hey oh it's okay or you know you're feeling grief because that animal is euthanized that's okay <laughs> but it, you know so just um continue talking about this and um I hope that all of you will talk about this at your own institution if you don't already. Marin, and I want to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. 
Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.